Callie's IN8 second wave. As of today, as of right now, because this certainly could change. This is, if not my favorite, probably at, at least, you know, up there in the top three, if I'm forgetting anything, uh, of speakers that I have reviewed so far. And I say that because it's an incredible value, in my opinion. It does so many great things, not just for like studio monitoring, but even just putting them in my living room and just listening to them and kind of jamming out with them. And it does it for, I think these are $800 a pair, $399 each. An incredible speaker. I, I truly don't know how Cali is able to deliver a product like this for such a reasonable cost. So let's dive into the Cali results and we'll talk about what I heard, what I liked, what I didn't like, and we'll go from there. About two months ago, Cali sent me their IN5. It was a five inch version of this speaker, a five inch. It had a five inch midwoofer version of this speaker. I tested that out, I sent it back to them. And then like a week or two later, I saw that they were releasing the second wave of the IN8. So the IN8 had some noise issues uh, and then they made some other tweaks too. This one remedies those issues and I had reached out to Cali to see if they'd be willing to send me that. They couldn't. I think somebody bought up all their stock is what I was told. But a fellow enthusiast said, hey, I'll send you one of mine if you want to test it out. So I'm testing somebody else's and they only sent me one. So when I did my listening, I was only able to do it in mono, unfortunately. But hopefully you guys are able to glean enough information to help you make a good purchasing decision. I'm going to go ahead and start things off talking about what I heard, and then we're going to go into what I measured and see if we can correlate some of the things that I heard with what I measured. I'm looking at my notes here. I see that I want to make sure I tell you subjective listening for this speaker because it is a near field monitor, uh, near field midfield, make that point, near field midfield monitor speaker. I listened to it at about one and a half meters uh, mostly. And I did go from one meters to three meters to kind of push it, you know, volume wise, and also to make sure that I was getting more and less room interaction as I changed my seating position to see, you know, what the tonality and the timbre, such a weird word, by the way, timbre, going off track, timbre is what it looks like, but it's pronounced timbre. And every time I hear somebody say timbre, I feel like they're saying it wrong, but apparently that's how you're supposed to say it. So if you didn't know, now, you know, um, and at volume wise, it was anywhere from like 80 to 95 dB. And I did push the speaker to max, but because it has a built-in limiter, you can't really break it. I mean, maybe somebody could, if you just threw square waves at it, maybe, I don't know. But I juiced this thing and I can never get it to make any kind of mechanical noise, you know, vibration, resonances, the woofers popping because it's just being pushed too hard, nothing like that. I don't want to say it's bomb proof, but man, it's a, it's at least a bulletproof speaker. Uh, the front port on this speaker means that you have the ability to place it against a wall without the ill effects of having, you know, port blockage and things like that. And this is a well-designed port because there's a lot of speakers out there, especially more budget minded speakers that have terribly designed ports that are way off of where they need to be in frequency tuning and, or they have a lot of resonances caused by the port or leaking through the port out into the atmosphere. Uh, you don't have that issue with this speaker at all. And the dip switches on the back, which just has plenty of them, allow you to put it, you know, pretty much wherever you need to, and then set the dip switches to control like console issues or against the wall issues or free field, that kind of thing. You have plenty of options there. There were a few areas where I thought improvement could be used and I was able to verify that by using the equalizer in my computer. I'm reading this note here, I say four to five kilohertz region where some music, particularly uh, Lido Shuffle by Boz Gags, excellent song. Uh, the sound would tend to jump out at you and have a little bit of bite. And when I went and looked at the data, I saw that. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Using my equalizer, I was able to cut that by about one or two dB with a, uh, what did I say? At around four kilohertz, four, four and a half kilohertz. And A being those two, not blind, but just kind of A being those two, I actually felt like 2 dB did a lot to resolve what I was hearing. So keep that in mind. Another area that occasionally stood out to me was in the one to 200 hertz region where some lower vocals tended to sound a bit hot. 
And it turns out that that was a resonance. I did do some testing and found that to be the case, but that was really rare. Uh, usually, if I key into that, that's that's prominent and prevalent in pretty much every track that I listen to. But it was really rare. And a matter of fact, I didn't even notice it until I was literally finishing up. Like I was turning around to my computer to pause the music because I was done with my listening tests. And then I caught it and I thought, huh, what was that? So I intentionally went back and listened for that. And it showed up as some resonances, like a little bit of a, instead of me just talking, it was like me just talking. And it lingered a little bit. It wasn't nearly as bad as some of the other speakers I've tested. And on a scale of like one to 10, I would probably rate it a two. But if you happen to hit the right song and you catch it, it's probably going to annoy you. Having said that, I do notice from other reviewers and talking to people that a lot of people don't seem to key in on those areas as much as I do. I mean, we're all adept to hearing certain things differently based on our past and our experiences. And that's one area where I usually key in quicker, um, whereas somebody else may pick up something in the high frequency area that I may not pick up at all. So that's my own personal experience and my background there. But the data does confirm that there is, an, there is a resonance in that area. So I'm going to make sure I mention that. The bass is really, really nice on the speaker and extends easily down to 50 hertz, providing you with plenty of kick drum, plenty of impact. But below that, it, it does roll off. If you're, you know, mixing music or you're listening to music that has a lot of low bass content, yeah, you're still going to need a subwoofer for the speaker. The hiss on this speaker is non-existent, in my opinion. The V1 version of the speaker did have hiss. A lot of people complained about it. I actually tested that about a month ago, and yeah, you could easily hear that. But on this speaker, not the case at all. Um, so I would say that unless you put your ears right next to it, the speaker, or if you're sitting a few feet away in a anechoic chamber, you're not going to hear the hiss. That's my opinion. The thing I really like about these speakers, and I, and I, I really don't know if this, if this was A B blind testing. I, I don't know if I'm being honest with myself or if I'm just believing what I think I hear. But I really feel like you can hear more nuance. In, in the music with the speaker. And I'm not even talking about like a little high treble thing kicking off. It just seems like you, I don't know how to describe it. It just seems like you can hear a little bit more detail with this speaker than you can others. And I think that just really comes down to the, the fact that it's a well-designed uh, near midfield monitor. It's mostly flat on axis. It, it does have some issues because it's a coincident driver and all coincident coaxial drivers have some on axis issues. But if you tow it off axis just a little bit, and Cali, I think, recommends even 10 degrees, which is in line with most manufacturers' recommendations for coaxial speakers, that goes away. So once you do that and you just turn your, your head a little bit or turn the speaker a little bit, I definitely recommend the speaker. I really and truly love the speaker. And if I had the means or the, or the room, um, I would own the speaker myself. I'll, I'll just say that. I would proudly own the speaker myself. Now what I want to do is I want to scroll back up to the data and I'm going to walk you through my website where the data is hosted and talk to you about the measurements that I got for this speaker. A couple things I want to mention up front is I have a series of videos where I talk about what the data means and how to understand it. That way I don't have to go into deep devil, devil, deep detail in this review, uh, save us time in the long run. If you want to check that out, I'll put a link to the playlist right here. And the other thing is that I test using Klippel's Near Fill Scanner, which is a state-of-the-art measurements device that allows you to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic room. I test in my garage, and I'm able to tell you what the speaker would do free air without any room influence at all. And that's very important to understand because you can get an idea of how the sound radiation pattern is um, without any room effects. Uh, bass, same thing. So across the board, you know what the speaker itself is doing, and, and that's very important to understand when you're talking about trying to figure out what speaker you want, what speaker you like, and the sound they're in. On my website, I have a, a little bit of a, a couple notes here. Uh, this is, I forgot to mention, a three-way powered speaker. Uh, retails for $800 a pair. It has XLR, TRS, and RCA phono inputs, as you can see here. It has a volume knob, so you can left-right gain match if you, if you need to. If one is a little bit further away in your situation, you need to change the balance on the speakers a little bit. Then it also has a series of dip switches and you can control, you know, the boundary compensation and whatnot for the speaker with those dip switches. In this case, the speaker's reference axis was at the tweeter and 
I set the volume to, I say zero, I think I actually set it to max with the XLR inputs and all the dip switches were set to the free field setting, which comes uh, as the default state. The measurements are all done in accordance with the CTA 2034 standard. You can download that link for free if you just click it here and we're gonna continue on. So the on-axis frequency response, as I said before, it's not dead flat, but darn it, it looks pretty freaking close. Uh, you have a, a null right there. Not really sure what that is, but I think that really does line up with the resonance that I was hearing because it's right around the same point, and I'll show you that a little bit later. Uh, there is a little bit of a resonance here. These are very, very minor, probably not even audible for this one. And then as far as something being audible, there's a bit of a dip right through here, and I actually did hear that. So tweaking for that helped bring a little bit more life to the sound, and I think in order to do that, I just put about plus one and a half dB at one kilohertz just to bring this up a little bit. This area, though, is really the area that I, if, if there was anything I didn't like about the speaker, this was it. This right around this four to five kilohertz region. And that really kind of made things sound a little bit, um, I don't know, forward, brash. I, I don't know a, a proper way to describe that without using a subjective audio term, but that's what it sounded like to me. And then when I turned the speaker just a little bit off axis and I used EQ, knocked that down just a little bit, cleared right up and made it a wonderful speaker. This dip right here, I believe, is probably due to the uh, the distance between the tweeter and then it looks like the voice coil former sticking up around it. And I'm thinking that's causing some cancellation effects there. I don't know. That's just a guess. And what's causing it doesn't really matter as much as the fact that it is there. And that goes back in, in lieu with my uh, recommendation for listening slightly off axis. So you want to turn the speaker just a little bit off axis to get rid of that dip because, yes, you can hear it. But by turning it off axis, you get less interference there. If you look at the listening window, you can see that it follows in line with the on axis response and it actually fills in right where that on axis dip is. Uh, the sound power profile and directivity does have a dip right around the one kilohertz area. And that's where I recommended, you know, you can EQ that up. Let's see, uh, it gets more narrow as it goes higher in frequency, and then it gets broader when it gets to the tweeter region. And that right there would tend to sound a bit bright if the speaker had a wider radiation pattern. And in this case, it doesn't. Now the ELAC UBR62 that I reviewed, and I will try to link it up here if I have it done by now. Um, that was an interesting speaker. I recommend you check my discussion about that out because with coaxial designs, typically the sound stage isn't going to be wide. And that's what I noticed with this speaker is that it wasn't very wide, uh, but it was very, very deep. And I really, really appreciated that. I always love that about coaxial designs. The estimated in-room response. This assumes that you're going to be about two meters out in a typical room. And the estimated in-room response has a more shallow profile than I think some people may prefer. But remember, you're most likely going to be listening to the speaker maybe even closer to this, uh, maybe within like a meter, so about three feet or so. And the response is gonna have a little bit even more of a bump in the high frequency area, probably around maybe eight kilohertz. It's gonna peak up just a little bit more. Um, this isn't necessarily bad, I don't think, because this speaker is designed to be a monitor and it's designed to be listened closer to rather than further away. But it's worth noting and kind of pointing out that the uh, profile does look fairly linear other than, again, this four to five kilohertz region, which I EQ down, made the speaker sound a lot better. And I think that's telling me why. Now we're going to look at the radiation pattern horizontally. Uh, you can see that the red indicates some bright spots in the treble. That's nothing that we had, didn't see previously. So I'm going to focus really on the orange and talk about the radiation pattern. As you can see, uh, going higher in frequency, the radiation pattern does narrow up, but it stays somewhat consistent. However, this 8 to 13 kilohertz region uh, does some interesting things. So keep that in mind when you're listening to the speaker. And if you hear something that maybe in the high frequency area that you're not quite fond of, it could be this, and you may want to apply some EQ to that area. Vertically, you can pretty much be wherever you want with this speaker. I mean, within reason, obviously. It looks like you could probably go plus or minus 10 degrees and be completely okay uh, you could even maybe go out to plus or minus 20 degrees, but that's going to be pushing it beyond that point. And this, of course, is just a indicator of what you can try. It's not saying what is going to be the best. In terms of distortion, the speaker does have a limiter. So even at 96 dB, the distortion profile 
looks reasonable. I don't really see anything here that concerns me. I mean, you can see that there's a peaking going on here and more than likely this is just the tweeter area, but that's still below 3%. And that's at 96 dB, not really an issue. Uh, at 86 dB, it's below 1% THD. So uh, profiles of the distortion, in my opinion, they look fine. The area that we need to focus on though is the uh, compression effects. And this is simply me just saying, hey, what's the frequency response changing like as I increase the volume from 76 dB to 102 dB in the purple case? So at 86 dB step in the red, the volume or the frequency response linearity is unchanged, basically. Uh, the same thing for the 96 dB. So as long as you're staying under 96 dB at one meter, the speaker's dynamic capabilities are unfazed and you're gonna be pretty much hearing the same thing from 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz at any of those volumes in between. When you get to 102 dB, so somewhere between 96 and 102 dB is where the limiter kicks in and it purposely uh, slopes the bass profile so you're not putting too much energy into the speaker and blowing it. But otherwise, you know, I'm what I'm seeing here is kind of what I expect and I'm actually pretty impressed by the uh, output capabilities. This means that while you probably wouldn't use this as a home theater speaker, you could use this for critical listening at a maybe three meter distance at higher volume levels and be completely fine. Now the cumulative spectral decay is something that I rarely provide and I usually only provide it when I find or I hear something that looks kind of funky and I wanna see if there's a resonance going on. And in this case, what I'm seeing is a resonance showing up at about 160 hertz. And then here's an example of the boundary settings. If you wanna go to my website, you can see what the boundary settings do. This is all from the IN5 that I tested before. I'm gonna assume that the boundary settings are probably the same here, or at least within ballpark. Now, the other thing that I wanna show you is a comparison of the on-axis response to the Kali IN8 V1 that I tested last month. And I have the V1 in blue. I have the V2 that I've got right here in black. And you can see that in black is much more linear throughout, I would say there's less um, sudden changes in the frequency response, but more than that, let's look at the estimated in-room response and you can see that the blue response um, is worse. Yeah, I mean, definitely see some areas of concern here, whereas the black response, the V2 that I'm testing now is more linear and for the in-room response based on what I'm seeing. I mean, certainly it still has some issues, but overall, I think it's more linear than the V1 and it does seem like a solid improvement. And that is it for this review. I hope you appreciate it. I hope you learned something. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Otherwise, I appreciate you watching and I hope you learned something, like I said, and I will talk to you all later. Have a good one. Peace.